Book Two, Part Two of Ovid's Metamorphosis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Metamorphosis by Pobilus Ovidius Nasum. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book Two, Part Two. Now, after Phaeton had suffered death for the vast ruin wrought by scorching flames, all the great walls of heaven's circumference, unmeasured, views the father of the gods with searching care, that none impaired by heat may fall in ruins. Well assured they stand in self-sustaining strength, his view, at last, on all the mundane works of man is turned, his loving gaze long resting on his own Arcadia. And he starts the streams and springs that long have feared to flow, Paints the wide earth with verdant fields, Covers the trees with leaves, And clothes the injured forests in their green. While wandering in the world, he stopped amazed, When he beheld the lovely nymph Callisto, And fires of love were kindled in his breast. Callisto was not clothed in sumptuous robes, nor did she deck her hair in artful coils, but with a buckle she would gird her robe and bind her long hair with a fillet white. She bore a slender javelin in her hand, or held the curving bow, and thus in arms as chaste Diana, none of Menelaus was loved by that fair goddess more than she. But everything must change. When bright the sun rolled down the sky, Beyond his middle course, She pierced a secret thicket, Known to her, And having slipped the quiver from her arm, She loosed the bended bow, And softly down upon the velvet turf, Reclining, pressed her white neck On the quiver while she slept. When Jupiter beheld her, Negligent and beautiful, He argued thus, How can my consort, Juno, learn of this, and yet if chance should give her knowledge, what care I? Let gain offset the scolding of her tongue. This said, the god transformed himself, and took Diana's form, assumed Diana's dress, and imitating her, awoke the maid, and spoke in gentle tones. What mountain slope, O virgin of my train, hath been thy chase? Which, having heard, Callisto rose and said, Hail, goddess, greater than celestial Jove, I would declare it, though he heard the words. Jove heard and smiled, well pleased to be preferred above himself, and kissed her many times, and strained her in his arms, while she began to tell the varied fortunes of her hunt. But when his ardent love was known to her, she struggled to escape from his embrace. Ah, how could she, a tender maid, resist almighty Jove? Be sure, Saturnia, if thou hadst only witnessed her, thy heart had shown more pity. Jupiter, on wings transcendent, sought his glorious heights, but she, in haste departing from that grove, almost forgot her quiver and her bow. Behold, Diana, with her virgin train, when hunting on the slopes of Manilus, amidst the pleasures of exciting sport, espied the nymph and called her, who, afraid that Jove, apparelled in disguise, deceived, drew backward for a moment, till appeared to her the lovely nymphs that followed. Thus assured deceit was none, she ventured near. Alas, how difficult to hide disgrace! She could not raise her vision from the ground, nor as the leader of the hunting nymphs, as was her wont, walk by the goddess's side. Her silence and her blushes were the signs of injured honor. Ah, Diana, thou, if thou wert not a virgin, wouldst perceive and pity her unfortunate distress. The moon's bent horns were rising from their ninth sojourn, when, fainting from Apollo's flames, the goddess of the chase observed a cool, umbrageous grove, from which a murmuring stream ran babbling gently over its golden sands. When she approved the spot, 
lightly she struck her foot against the ripples of the stream and praising it began far from the gaze of all the curious we may bathe our limbs and sport in this clear water quickly they undid their garments but callisto hid behind the others till they knew her state diana in a rage exclaimed away thou must not desecrate our sacred springs and she was driven thence ere this transpired observed the concert of the thunder god her altered mien but she for ripening time withheld severe resentment now delay was needless for a distracted juno heard callisto of the god of heaven had borne a boy called arcas full of jealous rage her eyes and thoughts enkindled as she cried and only this was wanting to complete your wickedness that you should bear a son and flaunt abroad the infamy of jove unpunished you shall not escape for i will spoil the beauty that has made you proud and dazzle jupiter with wanton art so saying by her forehead's tresses seized the goddess on her rival and she dragged her roughly to the ground pleading she raised her suppliant arms and begged for mercy while she pled black hair spread over her white limbs her hands were lengthened into feet and claws long curving tipped them snarling jaws deformed the mouth that jove had kissed and lest her prayers and piteous words might move some listening god and give remembrance speech was so denied that only from her throat came angry growls now uttered hoarse and threatening still remains her understanding though her body thus transformed makes her appear a savage bear her sorrows are expressed in many a groan repeated as she lifts her hands if we may call them so repeated as she lifts them towards the stars and skies ungrateful jove regarding but her voice accuses not afraid to rest in unfrequented woods she wandered in the fields that once were hers around her well-known dwelling over crags in terror she was driven by the cries of hounds and many a time she fled in fear a huntress from the hunters or she hid from savage animals forgetting her transformed condition changed into a bear she fled affrighted from the bears that haunt the rugged mountains and she feared and fled the wolves although her father was a wolf when thrice five birthdays rounded out the youth of arcas offspring of lycian's child he hunted in the forest of his choice where hanging with his plaited nets the trees of aramanthian forest he espied his transformed mother but he knew her not no one had told him of his parentage knowing her child she stood with levelled gaze amazed and mute as he began approach but arcas frightened at the sight drew back to pierce his mother's breast with wounding spear but not permitting it the god of heaven averted and removed them from that crime he in a mighty wind through vacant space upbore them to the dome of starry heaven and fixed them constellations bright amid the starry host juno on high beheld callisto crowned with glory great with rage her bosom heaved she flew across the sea to hoary tethys and to old oceanus whom all the gods revere and thus to them in answer to their words she made address and is it wondered that the queen of gods comes hither from ethereal abodes my rival sits upon the throne of heaven yea when the wing of night has darkened let my fair word be deemed of no repute if you behold not in the height of heaven those new-made stars now honoured to my shame conspicuous fixed in the highest dome of space that circles the utmost axis of the world who then should hesitate to put a front on juno matchless goddess each offence redounds in benefit who dreads her rage o boundless powers o unimagined deeds my enemy assumes a goddess's form when my decree deprives her human shape, and thus the guilty rue their chastisement. 
Now let high Jove to human shape transform this hideous beast, as once before he changed his loaf from a heifer. Let him now divorce his Juno and consort with her, and lead Callisto to his couch, and take that wolf Lycian for a father-in-law. Oh, if an injury to me, your child, may move your pity. Drive the seven stars from waters crystalline and azure tent, and your domain debar from those that shine in heaven, rewarded for Jove's wickedness. Bathe not a concubine in waters pure. The gods of ocean granted her request. High in her graceful chariot through the air, translucent, wins the goddess, glorious child of Saturn, with her peacocks many-hued, her peacocks by the death of Argus limped, so gay were made when black as midnight turn thy wings, O chattering raven, white of yore. For long ago the ravens were not black, their plumage then was white as any dove, white feathered, snow white as the geese that guard with watchful cries the capital, as white as swans that haunt the streams. Disgrace reversed the raven's hue from white to black, because offence was given by his chattering tongue. O glorious Phoebus, dutiful to thee, Coronus of Larissa, fairest maid of all Ammonia, was a grateful charm, a joy to thee whilst faithful to thy love, while none defamed her chastity. But when the raven, bird of Phoebus, learned the nymph had been unfaithful, mischief bent that bird, spreading his white wings, hastened to impart the sad news to his master. After him the prattling crow followed, with flapping wings, eager to learn what caused the raven's haste. Concealing nothing with his busy tongue, the raven gave the scandal to that bird, and unto him the prattling crow replied, A fruitless errand has befooled thy wits. Take timely warning of my fateful cries. Consider what I was, and what I am. Was justice done? Twas my fidelity that caused my downfall, for it came to pass, within a basket, fashioned of small twigs, Minerva had enclosed that spawn, begot without a mother. Erichthonius, which to the wardship of three virgins, born of double-natured Cecrops, she consigned with this injunction, Look ye not therein, nor learn the secret. But I saw their deeds, while hidden in the leaves of great tree, two of the sisters, Herse and Pandrosos, observed the charge, but scoffing at their fears. The third, Aglaros, with her nimble hands, untied the knotted cords, and there disclosed a serpent and an infant. This I told Minerva, but in turn she took away her long protection, and degraded me beneath the boding owl. My punishment should warn the birds how many dangers they incur from chattering tongues. Not my desire impelled me to report to her, nor did I crave protection, which, if thou wilt ask Minerva, though enraged she must confirmed, and when is told to thee what lately fame established, thou wilt not despise the crow, begot by Coronius, who was lord of all the land of Phocis. I was once a royal virgin, sought by suitors rich and powerful, but beauty proved the cause of my misfortune, for it came to pass as I was slowly walking on the sands that skirt the merge of ocean, where was oft my wont to roam, the god of ocean gazed impassioned, and with honeyed words implored my love. But finding that I paid no heed, and all his words despised, he fumed with rage and followed me. I fled from that seashore to fields of shifting sands that all my steps delayed, and in despair upon the gods and all mankind i called for aid but i was quite alone and helpless presently the chaste minerva me a virgin heard and me assistance gave for as my arms implored the heavens downy feathers grew from out the flesh and as i tried to cast my mantle from my shoulders wings appeared upon my tender sides and as I strove to beat my naked bosom with my hands, nor hands remained, nor naked breast to beat, I ran, and as I sped, the sands no more delayed me. I was soaring from the ground, and as I winged the air, 
Minerva chose me for a life companion. But alas, although my life was blameless, fate or chance deprived me of Minerva's loving aid, for soon Nictimini succeeded me to her protection and deserved esteem. It happened in this way. Nictimini committed the most wicked crimes, for which Minerva changed her to the bird of night, and ever since has claimed her as her own instead of me, and this despite the deed for which she shuns the glorious light of day, and conscious of her crime conceals her shame in the dark night. Minerva's owl now called. All the glad birds of day, indignant shun, and chase her from the skies. But now replied the raven to the crow that talks so much, A mischief fall upon your prating head for this detention of my flight, your words and warnings I despise. With which retort he winged upon his journey, swiftly thence in haste, despite the warnings to inform his patron, Phoebus, how he saw the fair Coronis with a lad of Thessaly. And when Apollo, Phoebus, heard the tale, the busy raven made such haste to tell, he dropped his plectrum and his laurel wreath, and his bright countenance went white with rage. He seized his trusted arms, and having bent his certain bow, pierced with a deadly shaft that bosom which so often he had pressed against his own. Coronis moaned in pain, and as she drew the keen shaft from the wound, her snow-white limbs were bathed in purple blood, and thus she wailed, Ah, Phoebus, punishment is justly mine, but wherefore didst thou not await the hour of birth, for by my death an innocent is slain? This said, her soul expired with her life-blood, and death congealed her drooping form. Sadly, the love-lore god repents his jealous deed, regrets too late his ready credence to the raven's tale. Mourning his thoughtless deed, blaming himself, he vents his rage upon the talking bird. He hates his bow, the string, his own right hand, the faithful arrow. As a last resource, and thus to overcome her destiny, he strove to cherish her beloved form, for vain were all his medicinal arts. But when he saw upraised the funeral pyre, where, wreathed in flames, her body should be burnt, the sorrow of his heart welled forth in sighs, but tearless orbit, for no celestial face may tide of woe bedew. So grieves the poor dam, when, swinging from his right the flashing axe, the butcher with the sounding blow divides the hollow temples of her sucking calf. Yet, after Phoebus poured the fragrant myrrh, sweet perfumes on her breast, that now once more against his own he pressed, and after all the prematurely hastened rites were done, he would not suffer the offspring of his loins to mingle with her ashes, but he plucked from out the flames, forth from the mother's thighs, his child unborn, and carried to the cave of double-natured Chiron. Then to him he called the silly raven, high in hopes of large requital, due for all his words. But, angry with his meddling ways, the god turned the white feathers of that bird to black, and then forbade for evermore to perch among the favored birds whose plumes are white. End of Book Two, Part Two